Hello. Hi, guys. Hello. How are you all today? Good. Doing fine. Enjoying the weather? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it's not too bad. It's kind of mucky out. Cold. Thank you all for being here. Um, to start, um, could everyone just go around and maybe say your name and then just a little bit about the job that you do? Anyone can go first. Well, I guess I can start. My name is Heather L. Hoody, and I'm a social worker. Um, I got my BSW um, at Madonna University and then my MSW at um, Wayne State. And with a master's, a lot of fields are opened to me. Um, currently, I work at Oakland University as um, the field co a coordinator of field and student supports. But previous to working in academia, I've worked at the Children's Center downtown. I worked at um, Sanctuary, which is now called Common Ground Sanctuary, which is a youth runaway shelter. I've worked in adoptions at Spalding for Children, um, done research for Presbyterian Villages. So had a, I have a quite eclectic background. Mine's a lot faster than that. So I am a, uh, <laughs> I'm a small animal veterinarian. So uh, I work in uh, downtown Rochester, Oakland Animal Hospital. Uh, I've been a, a practicing veterinarian for 23 years. I went to Michigan State University uh, in the mid 90s for both my undergrad and uh, veterinary degree. Uh, and that's the story of my life right there. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Bittinger, and I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist, which is one form of advanced practice nurse. Um, I went to Oakland University back in 1984 and got my bachelor's in nursing, graduated in 89, um, worked at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak for about five years, and I went back to Oakland again and got my master's in um, nursing with a specialty in nurse anesthesia, became a staff nurse anesthetist at Royal Oak Beaumont. Um, and then um, joined the faculty in 2003 as admissions and clinical coordinator. Um, worked, have worked there, you know, for 25 years as a nurse anesthetist. And then in 2015, I did go back and get my doctorate in nursing practice um, from Oakland University again. So hence the, the black and gold that I'm wearing today. Um, and so I currently teach as an adjunct instructor for the nurse anesthesia program, as well as a clinical coordinator and still practicing nurse anesthesia one to two days a week at Royal Oak Beaumont. I'll go next. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Santoshi Banla. Um, I am uh, currently working at a company, a biotech company called Thermo Fisher Scientific, where I lead and manage a team of oncology scientists uh, to develop products for uh, clinicians and oncologists. It's a software solution. My background um, is that I have a bachelor's in biochemistry from India, and then I came here in 2000s to, uh, to pursue my master's in bioinformatics um, at Northeastern University in Boston. And um, during my time there, I interned at a company and uh, realized that uh, I did want to pursue further my interests in research and development in the industry environment. So I went on to um, complete my PhD in biological sciences at University of Albany, uh, the SUNY school system in Albany, New York. Um, and after that, um, my, my PhD was in evolutionary biology studying uh, genomics. Uh, you know, that's been my primary interest. Um, and I've continued to pursue that further um, by doing a postdoc, a three-year postdoc at uh, University of Rochester Cancer Center uh, for three years. Um, that then led me to a job here in Michigan. Uh, my uh, uh, company, Thermo Fisher Scientific, is located in Ann Arbor. And, um, and yeah, I've been with the company for over eight years now. So I'll stop there. I know it's, a, it's been a long, uh, long road, uh, but here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what's like a day to day? Like what, what do you do in your job like every day? What's like a normal day look like at your job? And we can just go around and everyone can answer again. So that means I go first. <laughs> Andrea, love the sweater. <laughs> go OU. <laughs> and 
and actually I'm getting my doctorate at OU and I forgot that. I don't know how when all I have is homework. <laughs> but um, for social work, because we're so diverse, every day looks different. And to be a social worker, you have to be able to know that your, your to-do list in the morning is going to change. Um, and that is just the normal, um, depending on, and it doesn't really matter what area of social work you're in because you could be in adoption, you could be you know, in a hospital, you could be at a shelter, you could be, you know, it, there's just so many you know, different kinds of things you can do. So the day starts off in one way, like most others, probably answering emails, seeing what happened, what you need to do. And then it could be appointments. If you have a private practice, it could be, you know, you know, person after person that you're working with if you're doing more clinical work, like say therapy, because you can do that with social work. Um, or again, like I said, could be very dynamic and very diverse if you're working in a shelter and a crisis happens. Or if you're working in a school and you have a student that walks in the door, that really needs your help around something, then whatever you had on your calendar stops and the focus is that person in front of you right now because they need you. So for somebody who doesn't like a normal day-to-day, -day, this is how it's going to be, social work could really be for you. <laughs> but there are other areas in social work that can be um, not so crazy like that. Um, if, you're, if you like research, there's lots of opportunities for research and social work also um, also, you can be doing more macro work um, and maybe working in the political arena or maybe working for the county, you know, you know, different kinds of government agencies, maybe working on a, um, an initiative around diversity, um, those kinds of things. So it wouldn't be, you know, where you would have crisis going on um, or if you're really into wanting to help people, then, you know, working with vulnerable populations then it could be, you know, pretty exciting and, and really your day just changes as it evolves. Uh, my day is uh, pretty varied. It, it's, it really changes every single day uh, as to whether uh, I'm on the floor. I mean, seeing patients, uh, a lot of it is outpatient, routine care, vaccinations, just uh, taking care of the pets, uh, just making sure that they're um, uh, healthy and up to date for their vaccinations and whatnot. And then I, during that same, same time frame, I might see emergency uh, cases. Uh, if I have an animal that comes in and has like a ruptured mass or a broken leg or something like that, I need to take care of that patient as well. Uh, other days I'll come in and uh, I'll be in surgery uh, the entire day. And that could vary from routine procedures, from like neuter procedures, dentistries, uh, all the way up to like orthopedic, like fracture repairs and whatnot. So it really, it really depends on what's coming in so and it's it's every single day is different and I really enjoy that aspect of my job because it's not it doesn't get monotonous or anything like that uh, but I think everybody here can probably relate to that that everything is different every single day <laughs> so but uh, yeah that's that's my day um, my days are always um, different as well and with anesthesia um, you know I, I do have some routine things that I do like I have to get to the hospital early I have to do a machine check I set up drugs that I'm going to need I set up airway equipment that I'm going to need but then that's where it kind of all stops. Um, I have to approach every patient, uh, depending on their medical history, um, what sort of allergies they have, what their history is like, what we're, what we're doing for them, what their body size is and things like that. Um, so each case is different, each day is different. Um, what I find is, is just, you know, what drives me every day is just the impact that I can have on a patient each day. You know, um, people are nervous about surgery. They're very nervous about anesthesia. They're always afraid they're not going to wake up. And it's my job to, you know, quickly assess them, but thoroughly make sure that they feel like they're going to be safe, that they're going to be well watched, that they're going to wake up, that I'm going to be with them the entire time. And, and it's just amazing to, you know, put somebody to sleep, to watch what we can do to the body while they're under my care. Um, keeping them asleep, keeping them safe, and then waking them up and, you know, having them, you know, say thank you or just be, uh, you know, really happy that that it's over. So there's a, a, an awful lot of, of gratification I get from my job every single day. All right. So um, I want to say I probably my day is a little bit more fixed and predictable compared to the rest of you here. Um, as, as a manager, so my office, it's an office environment. I do not work in a lab. Um, you know, I say that all our experiments that we do is done in a computer. And so um, my role is 
typically, because I manage a team of scientists here in Ann Arbor, as well as an offshore team, um, it's, it's mostly communications with them. And um, it, it's, it's a mix of you know, technical meetings to, to, uh, to work towards our product solutions, um, coaching and mentoring colleagues, uh, you know, a lot of them, it's, it's a combination of balancing uh, the work as well as the personal life. So I'm there to kind of support them for that. Um, and other than that, it's, it's, uh, it involves mostly technical and uh, strategic meetings and, and discussions with uh, product management. You know, these are uh, solely based out of the, like the business models and they, they work on what kind of products we should be selling. And I work on the technical implementation side of things. So it's, it's a lot of interdisciplinary um, uh, you know, work. And my day-to-day -day is pretty much, uh, you know, as bland as it may sound, it's been being in meetings. Uh, I am in, you know, on calls every day, um, but those calls are intended to either address um, you know, the product solutions or anything that may be a, a customer question from the field. Oh, and why you chose this career? And um, did you choose it from a young age or is it something that you kind of figured out later in life? Well, for myself, like when I was in high school, I wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to go to college. You know, I started off as a hairdresser um, thinking that that would be a great way to like make money I was at college was like cutting you know my friends hairs at the dorms and stuff like that and um but started off at OCC and just kind of tried a number of different things I you know went to cooking school I went did the um did some art stuff I tried business and law and really liked all those different things but it just nothing was just really hitting home for me and then um I left there and went to Madonna and I started off in um, nutrition and that just didn't make sense to me at the time, went into international business and I loved business, but we had a case study that really changed my life. That really made me think differently. And the case study was I'm in a third world country and I need to expand the parking lot and there's a family farm. How do you get the farm? For your parking lot and I raised my hand and said you don't and of course that just totally messed up the professor he's like what do you mean you don't I go you're in a third world country I am not going to take a farm away from somebody with for money have them move to the big city and now within a few years they're all going to be homeless when you're on a family farm that probably sustained people for generations not going to happen I would probably be that agency's worst nightmare <laughs> of course not what he wanted to hear and I really thought about it and took stock and thought, what makes sense for me? I really want to help people. I really want to do something that has an impact somewhere on somebody that's bigger than me. And I just kind of looked around and noticed social work. And I started taking social work classes and I felt like I was home because the backbone of social work is social justice. And it's so diverse. It just made sense for me that if I wanted to change things up in one area, I could. And I did. I was in, I mean, like my intro, I tried all different kinds of jobs and I landed in academia and love it because it is so diverse. And from here, I could go on and do many other things. And that's what I liked about it. I can't get bored. And as long as I take care of myself around self-care, it just, it really made sense for me. And so that's how I landed into social work. And I was probably... You know, I was wandering around in education because I love school um, for maybe four or five years, you know, going part time at a community college and then just really kind of landing there. But I and everything that I did and what I learned, I can apply to my degree in social work and, and my career in social work. So because we are so eclectic, the diversity that I bring, that's myself and all my education makes sense in my field. So nothing's ever wasted. I was pretty bizarre. I, I figured it out very, very quickly. Uh, I'd say probably, probably like age six or seven uh, that this is what I wanted to do. Um, primarily because I, I had animals uh, when I was growing up and they were always, they had issues, they were all messed up. Uh, so we were at the vet a lot. So I got to know the, uh, the veterinarian uh, who was the, the uh, 
uh, primary owner. So at the, at the facility that I'm at right now, uh, he's retired. So at this point, which is, which is great, but I still keep in contact with him. Uh, but yeah, I figured it out very, very quickly. So this is what I wanted to do. And I kind of pushed forward now getting in, getting into uh, vet school was a little bit more challenging. Uh, there were, when I applied, there were about 1500 applications for about 90 seats. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, it was it was tough. So I had I had a couple of other uh, other options. I was going to go into forensic science. I wanted to work for the FBI. Uh, obviously, I got into vet school, so that didn't pan out. Uh, but I also had um, uh, an interest in uh, jazz performance. Uh, so I I play saxophone. So I still play saxophone at this point, but I, it's a hobby. <laughs> I'm not trying to make money at it, and I'm really not that good. But still, <laughs> so I, I I still try to do it. But yeah, I figured it out very very quickly. Similar to Tim, I knew very early. I remember in kindergarten checking out a book in the library that said I want to be a nurse, and so I knew at a very young age, um, probably because there was a TV show on. You guys may know, remember it? Emergency it was my favorite show when I was little. I always wanted to be like Dixie. I also have an older sister who is a nurse, and I just emulated her. Um, I, I, I was kind of a sickly kid. I had a lot of problems with my tonsils and things like that, and was always sick at the doctor's office. So I thought I was going to be a pediatric nurse practitioner. So when I was in nursing school, I did have a job in a pediatric intensive care unit. And I found myself not being with as thrilled with the pediatric population as I thought I was going to be. So when I got out of nursing school, I just took a job at Beaumont in their intensive care unit. And I didn't have any really aspirations to do anything further because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, I was invited to shadow in the operating room about three or four years after I got out of nursing school and was working in the ICU. And I shadowed in the operating room by uh, shadowed a nurse anesthetist and I immediately was smitten with it. I knew that that is where I needed to be, that that environment in the operating room where I had um, the control over somebody's breathing, their heartbeat, their uh, everything. I just knew that that was the profession I needed to be in. So I did apply to anesthesia school and was admitted and I've never looked back. Um, I absolutely love what I do. And even though it wasn't my ultimate goal, um, nursing definitely was um, my, my passion, my calling. And I'm not at all, um, you know, um, I, can't, I have no regrets with my decision. I absolutely love it. And I have, actually have a daughter who's a nurse and in starting nurse anesthesia school this fall. So that's a great um, testament to, you know, the profession itself is to have your, your child fall in your footsteps. Let's see. I, I don't think that I always thought that I would be, you know, where I am today, but uh, that's because growing up, I always thought I, I would be a medical doctor. I wanted to be a, a you know, an MD, um, but it was, it was competitive back home. And so um, the, the passion that really drove me was science. And so I kept with it. Um, it was, uh, you know, the op options for me back home was, um, you know, you become a doctor or you're an engineer. Um, so I followed the passion for biology and, you know, pursued my, uh, my bachelor's in biochemistry, as I shared with all of you. Um, and I really, I, you know, um, I think for me, I, I kept my options open, um, although my foundational interest was always biology and sciences. I stuck with that, but always looked around and made sure I was aware of options, uh, keeping my goal of, you know, uh, getting my PhD and, and, and getting the tr right training that's required for me to get into the industry. Uh, you know, along the way, there are other opportunities that were presented, but um, it, it um, I, I would say I'm quite happy where I am as, you know, as a, um, uh, as a scientist. Uh, it, it drives me, it drives my interest to, uh, to, to problem solve each day. And, and I think that's, that was like the underlying uh, driver for me. Did money at all play a role in choosing your job or was it purely just because you loved that profession? Well, for me, um, a lot of people think that there is like no money in social work. Um, and what really started me in social work is just the passion of being around people and the diversity of the kinds of things I could do. Um, and, you know, I chose to, to move up in, in my field because you can choose to stay in the front lines working, you know, doing case management, or you can move up the ladder and run organizations. I mean, um, 
the CEO of Troy Beaumont is an MSW. So there's a lot you can do with it. Um, I did have an opportunity to go into um, clinical social work, um, but I decided I didn't want to do, you know, therapy. And I know I have friends that um, can charge the insurance company up to $250 an hour doing that kind of therapy. Um, so I always want to put that out there. So individuals, you know, they're always told, oh, well, if you're in social work, then you're going to be poor for the rest of your life. It's not true. I mean, like with all jobs, you, there's entry level and then you move up and then whatever trajectory or your interests are is, is where you go. So for myself, I wasn't really thinking money at the time. I was thinking of what was going to make me happy and want to go into work every day. And, um, and I hear that from, you know, all of everybody here on the panel, you know, we followed our passions, really. And um, am I making a good living? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Can I go further with it? I absolutely can. Um, but was money my motivating factor for choosing social work? It was not. It didn't even, I just wanted to be, I just, like I said, I just wanted to have a happy life doing something that I love to do and just, and money followed. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'll let go of that. Uh, money was not a driver uh, for me in any way, shape or form. As a veterinarian, I mean, at, at entry level is, is, it is what it is. It's, it, you don't make a whole lot of money as a veterinarian as you're going into the field. Once you start uh, developing your skill set, once you start turning into an experienced practitioner, uh, you can specialize in different types of things. And then at that point, I mean, the, yeah, the, the salary level will definitely go up. Uh, so you definitely have room for advancement. Uh, you can get into like ownership uh, and that's, that, that brings a whole different set of headaches too, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, you've got lots and lots of, uh, upward movement if you want to in my field. Uh, but to answer your question, no money had no bearing whatsoever. And so in, in my choice, and now I, I could have been a starving musician too, <laughs> so, but I, I was, I, I was happier with this cause it was relatively stable work, steady work, but it, this is what I chose. This is what I wanted to do. And yeah, money did not factor into it in any way, shape or form. Nurse anesthetists make a, a great deal of money. And so I get a lot of, um, because I do admissions for our anesthesia program, I get a lot of, of young people that will, will contact me. And, and I know that that's kind of one of the driving forces why they want to go into anesthesia. Um, but I always caution them that it, it will not, it will not be enough to get you through the program. The program is really rigorous, 80 to hundred hours a week for three years. Um, and it also, you know, it, it's, it's not a willy nilly type of, of salary. I mean, we are responsible for keeping people alive and safe in surgery and in emergencies in the hospital. Um, even during COVID, you know, we were the first responders to airway emergencies in the hospital. Um, so it, it's a nice amount of money to make. It's phenomenal, honestly, but it is well earned and um, it is, you know, comparable to the level of responsibility that, that we are given on a daily basis. Now, being in academia, um, now that I teach for an anesthesia program and do instruction and things like that, um, I don't make as much in that realm as if I worked in the operating room as uh, those hours, because you get, a, you get a, an academic salary versus an hourly rate. So um, being in education, I don't make as much as if I was giving anesthesia, you know, five days a week. So that becomes where your passion kind of comes into play. Um, that I have, you know, know that I, I could make more if I work just in the OR, but I, I don't because I love to teach. I really, really love to teach. I think I'll echo all of you here that um, money didn't play a big role. Um, and similar to uh, the panelists here, uh, I kind of followed what I felt would enrich and, you know, um, serve kind of my, uh, my interest and my, my curiosity. Um, and the money followed. Uh, again, as you learn on the job and you learn new skills and you apply it at work and you're able to demonstrate that, uh, you know, you've learned and you're benefiting uh, the, the purpose of the, the, the company, uh, the, the money and the recognition will follow, right? So I think that's, that's basically what I would just add on to the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you face day to day in your job? I mean, for me right now, working in academia, 
um, you know, it's, it's, you know, student safety, that their, their mental health, my students are doing well in what they're doing. Um, I work a lot with their internships. So are they doing well in their internships or are there difficulties? Um, so, you know, especially with COVID, that's been very stressful on our students. Things aren't the way they thought they'd be, you know, what they're, what they dreamt of having their senior year is very different now than when they started. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, in social work, it's like, you know, yeah, your internship wasn't what you thought it was, but that's kind of what we do. It's like, what does the day look like? What's needed? And that's when we jump in and we make it happen, you know, um, where, you know, we're pulled to wherever the need is. And, and whatever the population is, is driving us. So, you know, that's, you know, one of the, I really don't, wouldn't call that necessarily a challenge because I get excited over that kind of challenge when something is, and this, you know, it's not that I like it when things go wrong, but I like the challenge of helping it get better, you know? Um, and so I get excited and revved when it's like, oh, there's a problem. I'm like, okay, let's jump in, let's go, you know? How can I, do I know exactly, is there a book that says, this is how you fix that? No, there's books of suggestions and theory and ways to go about stuff. Um, but it's, you know, each person's so different, each situation so different, each community so different um, that I find that exhilarating and, and exciting. So, you know, um, and you really have to be that kind of person in social work to just really get excited over the challenge of whatever that day might bring. Um, so as far as, you know, the worst part of my job in academia is reading a really badly written paper. <laughs> you want to torture me, write poorly and hand it in because I have to read it and correct it. And that's, that's a challenge. Excite me, put on some good work, put some thought in the work that you do, love it. Cause then that's letting me help watch you grow and develop as an individual that's going to go out into the field of social work and help vulnerable populations to, you know, um, not become vulnerable um, and to grow and thrive. And so, you know, kind of almost like, you know, what is a challenge for me? It's a little different, <laughs> but yeah. The biggest challenge is really the, the bad papers. <laughs> and Andrew's going, oh yeah, I know, totally understand. <laughs> the primary challenge that I deal with is um, uh, keeping keeping my staff happy. So making sure that morale is maintained, uh, especially right now, but even, even before the, the pandemic, um, it was making sure that everybody's it feels like they're they're rewarded uh, for their work, uh, and and then we're able to take care of the the individual patients and uh, the clients attached to those patients uh, to make sure that everybody is satisfied uh, with their care, as well as uh, making sure that again that people are happy in their work. Um, pandemic obviously threw a whole different curveball at that, uh, which is uh, very very much very much more stressful. Uh, but that's even beforehand that was a primary challenge uh, that that I that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but I still love it. I'll still keep going. Um, I think from a nurse anesthetist standpoint, you know, there's, there's a couple different factors in there. Um, one of the biggest things that we face in the operating room um, is what we call production pressure. So there's, there's always that let hurry up, let's get on time. Um, hurry up, wake your patient up. You know, I think, you know, people think we have a, like a remote control, like patients awake, patients asleep, patients moving. It doesn't happen like that. Every patient responds differently to medication. So as much as we try to, to taper off the, the anesthetic gas or time properly, the administration of reversal agents, it doesn't always work. So sometimes there's that production pressure to hurry up, get the patient um, awake onto the cart into recovery and start again. Um, that's a big one. There's a lot of um, personalities in the operating room too. So, so interprofessional dynamics is diff is interesting. You know, um, we might start the day with a very nice surgeon, and the second surgeon might be a little bit on the crabby side, and the third one might be, you know, very jovial and 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 just dealing with the the different personalities all day long. Um, different anesthesiologists that I work with. So there's just a lot of, of moving parts, a lot of emotional connections between people. Um, one of the other things that I think our profession struggles with um, 
is what is the difference between a nurse anesthetist and an anesthesiologist? And you know, majority of the patient population understands what an anesthesiologist is, but they don't really know what a nurse anesthetist is. Usually they, they think that the anesthesiologist is with them the whole time and they don't realize that we are the person that's with them you know, from start to finish. And so um, you know, it gets a little frustrating because they kind of get the credit, but we're really the ones that are there with them. Um, so you know, that's just another thing. And it's just with COVID right now, again, that added a whole other layer to what we're dealing with because you know um, who around us might have that potential um, virus and we are in their airway you know I am putting that breathing tube in the patient and even though they might get tested does that mean that that test was was you know true um, so we've really had to um, be very very cognizant of, of protecting ourselves and protecting those around us because we are in the airway so that's provided a whole other layer of, of you know daily stressors yeah, uh, from my uh, viewpoint, I think the, the the more recent challenge has been, you know, COVID, like all of us are living through it. Um, we are based, you know, we're an office-based team and we thrive on interactions, in-person interaction, and that's been completely cut off, you know. Uh, thankful for technology that we're able to do things like Zoom and, you know, use Microsoft Teams. But that used to be our innovation bubble, you know, those conversations, what we call the water, you know, the kitchen conversations, those don't happen as much. So that's been a challenge. Um, and as a manager, you know, that's been one of the, the things that uh, I've, I've had to kind of manage uh, in lieu of not being in the office. In general, um, I think one of the challenges uh, for someone in my role would be to make sure, and I think Tim kind of nicely mentioned it, is to make sure that the team is happy, right? That they that their job and that their uh, contributions are recognized. And then making sure that the leadership is also uh, in the know of what we do and why we do it and why it's important, right? So half of the time it's like selling uh, you know, convincing your leaders why we do, uh, what we do is important. Um, and so it's finding the balance. I think that's the challenge that, um, quite frankly, it still drives me, right? I, as uh, I was saying that it's, the ch it's, it's not a bad thing to have those challenges because then it drives you to actually um, mitigate that. So um, yeah, so, some of those challenges uh, that I could think of. Um, has technology affected your career in any way? And have you had to like kind of had more training or like adapt to it? Um, well, COVID definitely changed the technology in academia, putting face to face, you know, classes to everything being virtual. So, you know, I live on Zoom now. <laughs> when I meet with students, it's all it's all virtual. Um, and you know, you you just learn to adapt. It's, it's that kind of thing. You just, you just roll with it. Um, I'm personally somebody who just, I like hands-on. I like face-to-face. -face, I like being social, you know, it's in my name, social worker. You know, I just, I love that kind of interaction and I, you know, and now we don't, um, or not as much, I should say. It's just, it's very different. It's, and I'm really looking forward to coming back, but, you know, that kind of technology, I'm sure, is not going to go away now. Now that we have it, um, because it's even opened up doors for people. You know, if you can't afford to take a bus or have, you know, um, transportation to get get a service or have a meeting with somebody um, in our field, then your clients can now call in if they have a phone, and and now those processes are all online. And so I think at the beginning of COVID, things um, were difficult. Um, but then we figured it out and now things are, are rolling again and, um, and we're moving forward with them. Um, but as, as technology changes, um, you know, we grow with that. And I think um, it's, it's probably different than in other kinds of sciences because I don't, you know, the technology that I really deal with is like, you know, my computer programs and, and my communication programs you know, those kinds of things. So I, I, I've not really had to run into, into other kinds of technology changes that I know other fields, you know, those changes are, you know, um, 
much more demanding and more ongoing than they would be in, in my field. Okay. Um, I, from a technology standpoint, in veterinary medicine, especially with the pandemic, we shifted a lot towards um, like Zoom rechecks, uh, where I'll be able to have even a patient stay at home. Uh, if I have like an orthopedic recheck, I can uh, watch the animal walk around inside of a room uh, and we can... Um, just have the client manipulate the, 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 the limbs and we can, we can develop a, again, just a, just that recheck, uh, just second, just with a, a, a virtual type of an experience. Uh, other things that we can try uh, that, that we, from a technology standpoint, I mean, uh, CTs, MRIs, I mean, all that stuff is entering into veterinary medicine, becoming a lot more available. Uh, we have uh, ultrasound technology is getting so much better. Uh, in that, I mean, we can locate nerves uh, at this point, just with nerve blocks. I'm sure Andrea can probably comment on that. Uh, but it's technology is being utilized a lot more aggressively within veterinary medicine, uh, which is it's it's good and it also has some some challenges as well. I mean, there's the AI aspect which is coming up, uh, and is that going to start kind of taking the place of uh, veterinarians? Uh, whether or not that's going to <laughs> that's going to be an issue. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, again, it could be good. It could also be a bad thing. So, but. you know, in the, in the almost 32 years since I've been a nurse and 25 as an anesthetist, I've seen a huge change and advancement in technology. Um, you know, our anesthesia machines are now pretty much all computerized, whereas before they used to be just very um, barbaric kind of machines that you, you know, could program very little. Now there's all sorts of different, um, adaptations to the machines that we utilize. Um, you know, when I first got into the field of anesthesia, um, we would do paper charting for all our vital signs and everything that we did. Now everything's automated. It feeds right from the monitor into uh, the electronic medical record. So that's been a huge advancement. Um, a lot more with biomedical engineering as far as um, the types of prosthesis that we're putting into our patients. So that has changed you know, what we have to do as, as anesthesia providers in um, facilitating um, maybe a longer or a shorter um, period of anesthesia. Robotic surgery is huge. We have six operating rooms that we do robotic surgery on at Royal Oak Beaumont alone. And each one of those rooms can do, you know, two to four surgeries. So that has been a, an enormous um, advancement in the profession of surgery. Um, there's just been a lot of, of advancement um, in, in the technological aspect. Um, you were mentioning ultrasound. We use ultrasound now for putting in nerve blocks, for putting in arterial lines, even IVs. So just that aspect is huge. Um, and then our ability to help patients to, um, it, like when somebody has an aneurysm, um, we used to have to go in and like cut the aneurysm out. Now we're doing a lot through interventional radiology where we can thread up um, little coils into that area and kind of wall off the aneurysm. So you, you can assure that the patient's aneurysm isn't going to rupture, but you don't have to go in and do invasive surgery. So there's been a huge, huge, um, you know, amount of, of advancement and, you know, biomedical engineering is behind a good majority of that. So my hat's off to all the biomedical engineers because they've allowed us that opportunity to give great care. Um, you mentioned Robotic surgery, is that when robots do surgery? Well, robots don't do surgery. They're robotic arms that, um, so what ends up happening is we put the patient to sleep um, and then there are devices that get put into the abdominal cavity. Usually that's where robotic surgery is done. And then a robot, robotic arms kind of come over to the patient. And then the surgeon actually controls the robotic arms in the operating room. So they're doing the surgery, but the robotic arms um, because no matter what happens with, with us as human beings, we always have kind of a little tremor um, just because our body's always breathing and our heart's always beating. So you always have that. With the robotic arms, you don't have that. Um, so it's a lot more precise movement inside. Um, it, it's just, it's fascinating to watch. If, you know, I've been doing it long enough. It's kind of boring for me at this point, but when you're in the operating room and you're watching it, it really is amazing to see what can happen. Um, it also allows for a much smaller incision, which um, leads to better um, pain control afterwards, quicker recovery time. It's very cool. That is very cool. Yeah. That is really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, technology plays a huge role in my field. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the field of uh, uh, sequencing, uh, you know, can cancer genome sequencing. And, and we've seen 
a tremendous change from, you know, in terms of the, the technology and the cost of the technology, it has changed uh, over the years, over a couple of decades itself. Um, but in my day-to-day, -day, yeah, you know, technology, as I mentioned, is the, the very basic, now we have, we have uh, you know, meetings on Zoom calls, that's, that's, that's technology right there. Um, but I, uh, you know, in my day-to-day, um, I, I use the normal technology, you know, your, your Microsoft tools, et cetera. Uh, but I also work with a lot of software engineers and bioinformaticians who use other technologies. And uh, it, it helps to have those conversations with them and, and learn from them about the different technologies that they utilize. Not that you, you would go and start coding tomorrow, but um, you know, it's, it, technology is kind of uh, changing in different aspects. And it, it, it is playing a vital role in, in, in the day-to-day -day work that we do. Wow. Um, do you have any pieces of advice for someone who's trying to go into the field that you're in? Well, in social work, you gotta love people. <laughs> and, um, and like I mentioned before, um, social justice is your backbone, that you look at everybody and you want everyone to do well across the board. And, um, and, if, and if that excites you and that's important to you, um, then social work could very well make sense for you. And also um, in, in my field, because you really are working with vulnerable populations all the time, um, you have to think about personal self-care so that you stay healthy while you're helping other people get to that place too. Um, cause a lot of times if, if you don't take care of yourself and it's pretty, you know, it's like that, you know, in everything you do, you have to have that balance in life. Um, but with social work, because we do see, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm working with people that are getting past that and growing and that that's exciting too, but I've got to remember, I can't take that home and I have to be honored that I'm working with somebody and now that I'm seeing them, they're going to be moving into a better space. Um, and so that, that's the biggest thing with advi for advice with social work is, you know, self-care, knowing that it's, it's good to, to stay healthy and that I'm allowed to have a healthy, happy life. Um, and, and to know that my people that I work with are vulnerable and I have to do my best all the time for them, for everyone. So you know, you got to love diversity to, to be in this field. I think the, the primary thing that I would tell somebody who wanted to become a veterinarian is uh, that it's not all uh, animals, because uh, no matter what, there is a person attached to that animal. And a lot of times, instead of, uh, I, yeah, I'm treating the individual uh, animal's condition, but I'm also essentially treating the person too, uh, because the, the person is the, it, it, obviously they have this bond with this animal and uh, I need to make sure that that person is taken care of as well as, as the animal. So I, I, several of my classmates when I was going through school a long time ago, uh, they were more focused on the animal and they, they didn't, really, didn't really think, okay, I need to have human interaction skills. And uh, that is the primary, I guess that's the primary piece of advice that, that I would tell somebody that it's not all about animals, uh, it, it is about people. So, so you gotta make sure that you're comfortable with that, that aspect of it. And same thing with nursing, you have to love people. <laughs> um, you know, to be a, a certified registered nurse anesthetist, you have to be an RN first. So you do have to get into nursing school. So I do a lot of talks at high schools, you know, and middle schools and things like that. So I always tell people, you know, you have to be a nurse first. And so you have to align yourself with getting into a good nursing program. And then when you're in a nursing program, you have to make sure that you achieve um, pretty high grades. The average GPA getting into a nurse anesthesia program is a 3.75. So you have to have pretty high GPA in order to get in. It's very competitive. Um, and then, you know, in order to, to continue to challenge yourself when you're trying to get that experience. So you want to work in a high level intensive care unit and, and put yourself out there and get as much experience and exposure as you can to, to very, very sick patients so that you 
are um, very organized, very good critical thinking skills, very good communication skills when you get into anesthesia school. And then the program itself is, is challenging. You know, like I said, it's, it's very rigorous. It is a doctoral program. You're going to be doing a lot of didactic work. You're going to be doing research. You're going to be doing clinicals. Um, and, and you have to do take, you will take care of everybody. You're going to take care of little babies all the way up to organ transplants. And you have to love playing around in people's bodies because you're going to be putting tubes in their mouths and in their nose and playing around in their body orifices. So you got to make sure that you're comfortable with that. And you're going to smell a lot of bad things too. So you have to be able to do all of that. Yeah, I would, uh, I would resonate with that. I think you, uh, f- for the for the kind of job that I do, you still need to be good with communicating with people. Uh, you know, have those uh, those skills that are absolutely necessary. Um, I, other than that, my advice would be, you know, be humble and be willing to learn. Um, you know, as you're starting off, um, there's a lot that you have to learn. So look up. You know, there, uh, be open to asking for help to learn. Um, as, as you work your way up and, uh, you know, be humble in the process um, and, and just open to options, uh, quite honestly, because you never know what's out there. You know, it's good to have a goal, work towards it, but be aware of other possible options that could be explored. You guys all seem like you have pretty like busy schedules. How do you find that balance between work and like just free time or having just downtime? Well, in a lot of jobs in social work, sometimes it does follow you home or you have your phone with you. You know, you could be on call um, depending on on the kind of social work you're doing. Um, But I just, I really, you know, live in the moment when something is funny. I laugh. I laugh hard. I enjoy it. You know, Um, and when I want to see something to enjoy, I, you know, I jump for it um, because, you know, the work is hard and, um, and can be really sad, um, but at the same time, very rewarding and celebratory. And so I really do work hard that when I come home, I'm doing things that I enjoy. You know, I, I love cooking, um, which is good because I got to eat. So I just, I make it fun and I, you know, like being a happy person. And so I, I try to bring that with me everywhere I go. I use music, you know, cause I love music. Um, I mean, I totally, Tim, I totally get the jazz thing. My son's a, a jazz bassist and so love jazz, love the blues, you know, um, and just, you know, love, you know, hearing those kinds of things and just and, and taking the time to just slow down, look outside and go, wow, things are just beautiful, you know, and, and I find that as a form of self-care, just taking off those few minutes when, if it feels overwhelming, that deep breath, that settling in and, and, and finding beautiful things and, and simplest and simple things and, and, um, and keep my personal goals realistic in the sense of, you know, do I want that purse by Prada? No, not really. Are they beautiful? Oh, sure. (laughs) But that's not my, you know, that's not my necessarily my thing. Um, but, you know, being able to turn it off, um, under, you know, allowing the balance. Um, mindfulness is really big. And I know there's a, a real push for, you know, you know, mindfulness, being in the moment, enjoying the moment, those kinds of things. Um, and I do practice that. So, you know, life balance can be difficult in, in anything that you do, but I, I really make that point to just really allow myself to calm down and just, you know, notice little things that are beautiful and just absorb that. I'll uh, talk about it from two different perspectives. Uh, one is my uh, my associates. I'm, a, I'm in a seven uh, veterinary pra- veterinary in practice. Uh, five of them are associates. Um, I push my associates to only work a maximum of 40 hours a week. Uh, a lot of times they're working at uh, roughly about 35, 36 hours a week. Um, they do have access to their uh, their charts and whatnot from home. They can dial in remotely and whatnot. Uh, but I, again, I, I kind of track that a little bit just to make sure that uh, they're not <laughs> they're not going crazy because they need to have a, a good again work life balance. Uh, so that's that's how I approach it again from the associate standpoint. From my standpoint, I'm I'm one of the owners. Uh, there are two owners in my facility. Uh, we also have a practice manager. Uh, we hired the practice manager just so that 
they can take care of a lot of the stuff that I, so I can step away from the practice and enjoy my family and uh, maintain again, a, a decent work-life balance. Uh, I'd say I probably bad weeks. I probably put in about 50, 55 hours, uh, some good weeks like this, this past week, I took Monday and Tuesday off. And I think I'm going to put in maybe about 20, 25 hours. Uh, so, so again, it just, it's, it's really important to maintain that work-life balance and there's ways to do it. Uh, again, I, I'm pretty intense about what I do, but I also am able to step away, um, uh, to enjoy, uh, my family and uh, my life. So personally, I've always had the option, um, ever since we had our, I have three kids and they're older now, but when I had the third child, um, I went part-time because I knew that I wanted to be an active mom in my kids' lives. And I did the PTO parent and athletic booster parent, booster president, blah, blah, blah. So I was fortunate enough to have that, that balance where I could still do the profession I love and be an active mom. Now they're all out of the house and all that business. Um, I work four days a week now. So I still have that one day to do all the household stuff, like do the grocery shopping and clean the house and all that business. But um, exercise and, and being active is something that has been a foundation of my husband and I's um, life. Um, we met on the campus of OU. Um, he was a basketball player. Um, we have been active and we will probably always be active unless something happens. Um, so we, that's kind of part of our routine. You know, um, on the weekends we get up, we both run. Um, at night we might go to the gym. So that's kind of like scheduled into our lives. And I have found that if you kind of set a plan and you know that that's something you're going to do, you're more likely to do it rather than just kind of leave it up in the air. Um, if it happens to be one of the days where I'm teaching in the classroom and I don't start till 10, then I'll get up and take a run in the morning. But I know that if I don't work out a couple times a week, I'm not going to be a very nice person. So it makes me a better person to make that a priority. Um, I'll have more energy and I'll just be a kinder person to be around. Um, and my kids have told me in the years past, mom, you need to go take a run. Um, they know when it's time. Um, and, and, you know, Heather was talking about self-care. It's important for every individual. If you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. And that's from being um, a mom, a dad, a teacher, a professional, whatever. You have to take care of yourself. So it's really important. Make that a priority. Andrea, I, I relate to that. Uh, my husband says that to me. Uh, if, I, if I don't work out, he's like, you need to just go. You know, time out. Take one. Um, so yeah, you know, resonating everyone's uh, thoughts here. Uh, Self-care, uh, you know, work, workout, yoga, meditation. Uh, find what works for you, right? Um, my job, it's, it's, a, it's an in-office job. Uh, typically you could say it's a nine to five, but uh, there are days that I have to just put in the hours to, to get something done to deliver. Um, and for me, it's important to recognize that the work-life balance that we, we, we often hear and talk about can tip in one direction and, and versus the other. Uh, would it be a perfect balance all the time? No, um, but just recognize that when the uh, when work needs you, you're there, you deliver, and then you're able to walk away. And the same thing goes with the family. Um, and so, if you if you're a, you know if the family needs you, absolutely that comes first. There's no no second thoughts about it. And so you know just recognize that the scales would tip, and you just have to deliver on both sides um, as needed. Um, and then, yeah, I, you know, I make it a point that on the weekends, I have a six-year-old, almost six-year-old. Um, and so I make it a point that I'm absolutely like spending as much time as I can, uh, you know, uh, over the weekends with, with him. Um, and that's important for me because then I am refreshed to go back into work the next, next week. And, and um, it, it's just a good cycle to have. Yeah. Thank you. Um... What were your, what was your experience like after college? Do you have any internships or other jobs that helped lead you to where you are now? Um, in social work, you have an internship at both your bachelor's and master's. Um, so what you learn in the classroom, um, you have to apply um, as part of the curriculum. There's no way to get around it. Um, so it's, it's built in. And it's, and it's 
pretty long. It's uh, at a bachelor's level, it's 250 hours a semester. So that works out to be 16 hours a week um, for, for um, two terms, you know, um, back to back. So it would be your senior year, you know, your fall and winter, and then in your master's, um, depending on the program, it could um, generally, if you're going into advanced standings, that means you can get your master's in um, literally nine months. Um, upon graduation with your bachelor's instead of a two-year program you can get it done um, in one you know uh, one year and um, and it's usually uh, 450 um, to 500 hours uh, for the two terms together for your internship there again applying what you've learned in the classroom and a lot of times students will get hired in at their from where they get interns where their internships at, or it's a catalyst um, because you've proven yourself at that agency for so long that you know you've got great references and it's a small field. Everyone knows each other, so if there's a really good opening and they know you'd be a great fit, um, they help you along in your career moving forward too. Um, the last uh, year and a half of uh, uh, veterinary school are clinical rotations, uh, so we'll go through. Um, uh, starting to develop a skill set, working with uh, patients, working with clients, working with people, uh, figuring out all that aspect of it out. Uh, the, that being said, I mean, once you're a, a new graduate, uh, there is a definite learning curve uh, to get up to uh, up to speed, if you will. Uh, so having a new graduate come into a practice, you need to make sure you have a really good mentor uh, that, that you, you don't have a boss that's just going to take off and, and say, good luck. And so, I mean, that's it's it just it just can't work like that. Uh, so we, we take in uh, new grads every now and then. So um, we have all of our veterinarians are probably uh, I think our, our newest grad is probably about eight years out uh, at this point. So from a clinical perspective, I mean, they are really rock solid at that point. Uh, but it is it, it's that learning curve, that initial learning curve is, is, is a little bit challenging, uh, but it's also something where it can be very, very rewarding uh, to try and help somebody get to that level so of expertise. Because yeah, you graduate with a, a veterinary degree and you can do whatever you want. I'm, it, you, can, you can specialize. I mentioned that a little bit earlier uh, where you can go through internships and uh, turn into just an orthopedic surgeon or an oncologist or a cardiologist, ophthalmologist. I mean, there's different roads that you can go from uh, with regards to veterinary medicine, but uh, most veterinarians are general practitioners, which is, that's what I am. Uh, I can still do some of that other, other stuff, uh, orthopedic procedures and whatnot. I just need to learn how to do them. And there's all sorts of continuing education that I can go through to, to further my education. So in that regards. So for nursing and nurse anesthesia, both, you do your clinical rotations throughout your, your programs. Um, it's typically like the, the later parts of, of your education. Um, for nursing though, like when I was um, in nursing school, my last year, I worked as a nurse tech so that's like somebody who can do a lot of the tasks in the, in the hospital, but you cannot pass medications, you can't do dressing changes, things like that. Um, uh, and then you you know as soon as you you're done and you receive your certification or pass your board exam, you can work as an RN for a nurse anesthetist. Same thing, you know, you have well over two years of of clinical rotations, um, and then you you pass your certification exam, and then you join whatever institution you want as a nurse anesthetist, but um, the internships are for both of them are kind of integrated into the didactic program. Yeah, so um, I would say uh, in my experience, I think only my master's had a co-op program that was baked into the program itself. So I did a six month internship at that point, which was required by for the coursework. Um, other than that, you know, it wasn't quite a formal internship programs that I was uh, I was trained with. Um, during my bachelor's, I I did uh, do some research. So you know, you could join a research laboratory to get get some hands on research experience. Uh, it's it's always one way to get uh, you know just not just your lessons in the class, but actually hands on experience by working in a research lab. Um, and then you know, my during my PhD. Um, I had the opportunities to teach as a teaching assistant within the, uh, within the department. Um, I, I taught, you know, the uh, undergraduate uh, laboratory courses, um, as well as I trained, um, we had a training pro a 12 week training program for the New York State Police Forensic Scientists. So I was one of the instructors for that. 
uh, you know, it training them on how to do DNA analysis. And um, so again, the, the, the training there was applying what I was doing my research on, you know, just genomics in general, but in a different environment. And then, uh, you know, in terms of training my postdoc uh, served as another form of training which uh, is not quite an internship, but it, it, it was a full three-year um, uh, fellowship that I, I pursued. Thank you, everyone. Those are all the questions we have for today. Thank you so much for coming. I really enjoyed, um, we really enjoyed listening to and hearing about all your careers. They're all super cool and super hands-on, which is really, really interesting. <laughs>